All right, hello everyone. Uh, uh, Paul Saraja here. It's my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome you to uh, this uh, webinar uh, that we put together at Cardiovascular Innovations. Uh, this is in the spirit of um, our meeting, which is this coming July. Um, by participating in today's meeting, you do have access to um, uh, free registration to come to this meeting. Uh, and we certainly would love uh, to have you all uh, come. I've put together uh, this series of cases uh, as an example of um, uh, what uh, we like to talk about at CBI, and I, I do hope you enjoy uh, this webinar. Let's fast forward here. So this is again a, 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 a webinar that's in the series of uh, complimentary cases uh, sponsored uh, by CBI. So, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show you uh, uh, a few cases here. I prepared four of them. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure how many we'll get through in the next hour, but uh, I'm hoping that this will be uh, quite a bit interactive. And, uh, and Subhash, if I could ask you to help manage the chat room, um, since I do not have that up, uh, and certainly if there is um, our questions that come about, we can certainly uh, go through them as we look at each of these cases. Sounds good, Sounds good Paul. Thanks. Okay. So the first case is this 82-year-old woman, and she came to see us because she has symptoms of fatigue as well as low extremity uh, swelling. And what you can see here is uh, you can see a nice transthoracic echocardiogram with a torrential tricuspid valve regurgitation. If you look at this echocardiogram, uh, the RV is considerably bigger than the LV. Now on the screen, the RV is on the right side of the screen. And if you look carefully, uh, there's also a very uh, um, <clears throat> significant uh, interaction of a pacemaker lead that's essentially draping across the tricuspid valve uh, in association with uh, torrential uh, TR. Here's some uh, transesophageal echocardiogram uh, views, and you can see here on the left-hand side, uh, there's, again, you can see the coronary sinus uh, pacemaker lead uh, with the lead falling uh, into the right ventricle. And there's also a considerable amount of TR, as you can see here on the right-hand side. Uh, and this is with TE, uh, with orthogonal views across the commissural planes of the TR. So what we try to do is we try to see if mobilizing uh, the pacemaker lead would help uh, improve uh, the TR. And what we have here is we actually have a snare uh, placed through the right femoral vein. And what we're doing is we're taking the, the lead, uh, which is up here uh, uh, from the subclavian into the uh, coronary sinus, and we're grabbing it and trying to move it out of the way. And you can see here from this echo that with moving the coronary sinus lead that uh, we've made it um, out of the way of the tricuspid valve, but not surprisingly, there still is a considerable amount of TR. So with this information, we actually uh, uh, recognize that it would be possible to treat this uh, with transcatheter repair. And so we then mobilize the uh, coronary sinus lead with a a snare catheter, and this is the snare catheter coming up uh, through the femoral vein. We then uh, put the snare catheter around the coronary sinus lead, and the snare catheter is placed in the liver uh, with a, um, a movement of the lead out of the way so that we can then advance a mitral clip device. And here's the mitral clip device being advanced up from the groin over a safari stiff wire, and we're going to use this to place a couple of clips. This is how it's done here. You can see this uh, snare, which is holding the lead in, in the liver, and the, the mitral clip uh, being used off-label has been advanced into the right ventricle. We then uh, advance one and then two clips, and you can see here, here's the first clip. Here's a second clip. This is a steerable guide catheter uh, that was used to deliver uh, the CDS. Here's that coronary sinus lead, which even after removal of the snare, it's still draped uh, in the hepatic veins. And this is what it looks like when you're done. So here is the uh, 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 triclip device, uh, sorry, mitroclip off-label using the uh, tricuspid uh, uh, position. You can see here is nice, uh, excellent leaflet insertion. 
This is the first clip. This is placed on the anteroceptal area. Uh, and then the, we place a second clip here and the TR is uh, much improved. And so this is a nice 3D view uh, from the right atrium showing uh, the two clips in place and uh, in essentially the anteroceptal commissure uh, of the tricuspid valve. And here's a post-operative uh, echo uh, taken with transthoracic. Oh, sorry about that. Not entirely sure what happened with that. Let me just restart that um, real quick. Error reporting. Any questions as I pull these up so far? None, okay. So here's the uh, transthoracic taken postoperatively, and you can see the TR, which is, remember, it was completely torrential, uh, is now mild to moderate, and you can see the two clips uh, intact uh, there. Now we've learned a lot about what's approachable uh, for uh, use of the mitral clip device for uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So if you're wondering how to select patients for this procedure, this is how you do it. Uh, you usually use TEE, and the first thing you do is here in the upper left-hand side, you want to get an ex, uh, <clears throat> a nice uh, view of the uh, tricuspid valve commissure with and without color, uh, with color compare. And here you can see this is the commissure of the tricuspid valve, and this TR is closer to the aorta, so this means it is anoreceptal. You then take the color off and you drop a cursor across the uh, commissural plane here and X plane off of that to then get the leaflets that you want to target for TR therapy, which you can see here in this X plane view. Once you've done that, you then go uh, and take that X plane view off and focus just on these leaflets here. And that's how you can then analyze how close the leaflets come together because certainly there's a physical um, boundary with the device in which you do have to be able to reach the leaflets in order to grasp them. You then go into the transgastric view to confirm uh, that these leaflet gaps are okay. Uh, this again shows you the nice commissure of the tricuspid valve. This is a septal leaflet, this is the anterior leaflet, this is a posterior leaflet. And we're looking here in this anteroceptal area to see how big that gap is. And anything less than five to seven millimeters is approachable with the mitral clip device. So here's an example of a patient that's much more difficult. And here's a 14 review showing you a completely torrential tricuspid regurgitation. Here, this is a nice uh, transgastric view, uh, short axis showing again, a very large amount of TR uh, spanning uh, both the anteroceptal and posteroceptal commissure. And if you look here without the color, you can see how wide these gaps are. This gap was well over a centimeter it would not be uh, easily treatable with the mitral clip device. And the other challenge with this therapy is that you simply cannot treat what you cannot see. Sometimes you get a nice uh, views of the color, as you can see here, there's no question about the severity of the TR, but because of this very large fat limbus, uh, you cannot see the leaflets. And so <clears throat> this shadowing uh, from the TE probe will make it impossible to determine whether or not the leaflets are inserted in the mitral clip device. Another challenging aspect uh, with TR is deciding how much is meaningful. And I think as many others uh, are starting to think that the tricuspid valve is a relatively forgiving valve because the RV is so preload dependent. So here's an example. You can see that this is TR here. It goes from uh, essentially severe to moderate. What was interesting is that in this patient, uh, despite there still being moderate TR, the RA pressure essentially becomes almost normal, and this patient is asymptomatic. So <clears throat> what is meaningful in these patients probably is going to be different uh, when you compare them to patients with MR. In the next month, uh, there will be a, a Triluminate uh, Pivotal IDE trial. This is the U.S. IDE trial of the TriClip system. This will be a multi-center study in the U.S. and Canada. It'll be a randomization of tricuspid valve uh, repair with the triclip device. 
uh, versus medical therapy. I am the national PI with David Adams, and we expect to have the first patient in sometime in the next couple of months. And with that, and you can do, you can see some preliminary results with patients who have been treated as part of the early feasibility study. You can see here that uh, here's an example of TR before. Uh, again, this is mostly in the posterior septal area. Here's a, the transgastric view showing that TR there. Here's an example of the clips being placed here and the TR being eliminated or markedly reduced. So we look forward to seeing how this trial uh, goes about in terms of treating uh, patients with uh, TR. We know that TR has a very poor prognosis when left untreated. Uh, these are data from uh, the TBT registry on MitraClip that shows the cumulative incidence of mortality of one year uh, for severe TR uh, as compared to mild or moderate. In, a sense, in essence, when you leave TR alone at the time of MitraClip uh, therapy, uh, the um, risk of mortality is almost twice that as patients without severe TR. So severe TR really does need to be addressed. It has a very poor prognosis. Transcatheter repair is possible now. Uh, we do have to work through the imaging and the indications and the, uh, the standardized endpoints as to, as to where uh, uh, what type of reduction in TR we need, uh, but this will also all be informed hopefully in the next several years through uh, study. So that's the first case uh, thus far. Uh, any questions at all from uh, Subash or anybody online who have any questions about that? I can't hear you if you do have questions, so I hope there aren't any questions. <clears throat> Okay, the next case here is this 74-year-old uh, woman uh, who came to see us uh, with uh, symptoms of uh, heart failure. She, um, she <clears throat> presented with essentially just, oh goodness, I'm so sorry about that. Let me just do this real quick. Hey Paul, this is Subhash. Uh, some yeah. of the folks are asking for the dial-in number to the meeting. Do you have it? Because uh, they're having some challenges. So oh. if you could share it. Okay. Dial-in number. So let's see here. Uh, if not, then continue. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but okay. I'm getting a few texts regarding it. No, let's see here. Um, Join auto here. It Nobody's is. Can uh, just see this. Can everyone see this dial in okay. number? Uh, I'm a picture and I will send it to them. Hold on. Uh, I think that's great. Got it. You can continue. Okay, very good. Okay, hopefully, my PowerPoint won't crash again. So this is a 74-year-old woman who came to see us with severe heart failure. And what you see here is that uh, you can see uh, she actually has uh, quite a bit of mitral regurgitation. And this really was her only major morbidity. Uh, but what you can appreciate here is that if you look carefully, the valve is uh, pretty calcified around the annulus. You can see that here, especially in this short axis view, uh, with this quite uh, severe posterior mitral annual calcification. And this is exactly how it looked on the CT scan. You can see that the MAC uh, was uh, almost circumferential and uh, the volume actually calculated to being 18,000 uh, um, uh, milliliters in terms of um, calcification, very large amount. And you can also see that it was invading uh, the myocardium uh, and this invasiveness of the myocardium makes it very uh, difficult to treat surgically because whenever these uh, patients are treated with debridement, there's a very high risk of uh, AV groove uh, disruption. So the way this was uh, treated was through compassionate use approval of the tendine uh, valve. Uh, as many of you may be aware, this is a prosthesis that's placed uh, transapically. 
It's anatomically shaped. It's got an outer and an inner frame. It's got an anchoring tether uh, with a hemostatic pad uh, that helps hold it in place. And importantly, uh, the device is completely retrievable and uh, repositionable. So the way this is done is we use CT planning uh, to help uh, uh, determine uh, the exact fit uh, of the prosthesis. Uh, we do a CT image here, as you can see, and overlay the prosthesis and then look at the area of the LVOT to get an idea as to what um, uh, the area would be to minimize the risk of LVOT obstruction. And you can see the various cuts that are taken through the LVOT here and the neo LVOT here measure 311. And most people usually use about 250 or so as a good cutoff uh, for uh, safe placement of TMVR devices. We also do some CT overlay with this to make sure that the valve will fit properly. So here uh, you can see it's uh, the valve is heavily calcified uh, and the idea is to place it obviously on the inside of the valve without too much expansion. But here on the right hand side, you can see that when we put the valve in that there is potential impingement of the inner working of the mitral valve with this large anterior spicule as you can see here. So our goal is to actually mobilize that spicule uh, to then make room uh, for the tendine prosthesis uh, so that the leaflets uh, on the inner portion will be functioning properly. So the way this is done is so we went transeptal and we have a, a snare catheter here in the left atrium and it's grabbed a wire which has been placed through the left ventricular apex uh, across this area of mitral calcification. The snare uh, uh, was steered with an agilis catheter. And then over this rail, we then take a balloon catheter to make sure that we're free of cords. We want a cord-free path uh, when we're putting in uh, the tendine prosthesis. Now, uh, the reason why we created this rail is because we wanted to do balloon valvoplasty. And I also wanted to do balloon valvoplasty with the ability to immediately put in the tendine valve if the patient became hemodynamically unstable. So this <clears throat> rail, which is used for this balloon, uh, isn't normally done for tendine, uh, but it is normally done to help put in the sheath from a transapical apical view. But you can see that here we're using the rail uh, to dilate uh, this uh, area of MAC because we wanna mobilize uh, that anterior spicule. And with that, uh, you can see this is how it's done. Uh, the tendine valve uh, here in the top left, uh, that's a 3D view. Uh, it is coming towards you uh, with the aorta on top. And uh, with that, we uh, open up the valve slowly and we deploy it intraannually, as you can see here in the lower left-hand side, the MR is completely eliminated. And here in the top right-hand side, this is a full deployment of the tendine prosthesis. And here's an example of what it looks like in place. Uh, so this is, uh, again, uh, the tendine valve inside that area is severe MAC. We close the atrial septal uh, area with an occluder device you can see here. Here's some moving images showing how the prosthesis forms actually quite well. It moves with the MAC, uh, <clears throat> and it doesn't really displace the MAC because it's really intraannular. And you can see uh, here, uh, because we mobilize that spicule, uh, this area of the inner working of the mitral valve prosthesis is nice and round, and, uh, and that's what led to the elimination of MR uh, without mitral stenosis. We have now treated eight patients as part of a compassionate use therapy for uh, patients with severe MAC. We've also treated four others as part of a, a clinical trial. Uh, these are patients who have been treated uh, here mainly in the U.S., but also two cases in Europe. The STS is over 8%, although the STS does not uh, account for uh, severe MAC. You can see the MAC has looked like this patient, which I just showed you. It's also looked like a, uh, uh, this, and this patient here with large spicules invading the myocardium. Here's another example of MAC you can see here, uh, but it's been quite an amazing experience because with 12 patients, there have been no 30-day deaths and no uh, residual MR. We had one late death, and six patients have lived past a year and uh, are minimally symptomatic. So it's been a very uh, positive experience for a very difficult uh, condition uh, to treat. 
And so we've launched an early feasibility study of a uh, 10 dine and Mac. Uh, Vino Torani and I are uh, the two principal investigators. Uh, we have several sites in the United States and uh, we did our first patient in uh, this past December. Any questions about that case, uh, Subash or anyone? I'm just gonna look here and make sure there aren't any questions. Okay, it says here, how much ice am I using for uh, tricuspid um, clipping? So people have uh, used ice, uh, especially um, uh, 3D ice. The 3D ice probe is actually uh, uh, something that's being tested. Uh, I haven't used too much of ice, but I'll tell you, it's probably gonna become part of uh, the therapy uh, because you can see leaflet insertion uh, quite well. And I think it's still in its infancy, but I think it's gonna become important. And, and any role for CT in pre-planning, uh, it is. And so, uh, so you have to do CT uh, for uh, um, uh, the tendine and MAC because you need uh, the angles uh, to put the valve in and you also need the sizing. And then you use TE to guide the procedure. And uh, for closing the atrial septal puncture, I almost always do because it's usually uh, over um, uh, 28 to 30 French. Uh, and this patient, uh, you know, we had ballooned the valve and, and such, and so we decided to close it. And then uh, the risk of embolization, absolutely. I, I think there is a, a risk of embolization. It's something we don't know. Uh, one of our, our colleagues actually did uh, what I just showed you with a Sentinel device in place uh, because uh, of the embolization risk. Uh, but you know, we have not uh, had strokes uh, observed yet in our 12 uh, patients who have been treated, but I suspect um, it, it's certainly not trivial. So with that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move back uh, to um, um, the next two cases. Uh, so here's an 84-year-old um, uh, woman. She had um, had a previous repair about nine years before she came to see me, and uh, she had had a shortness of breath uh, for the previous six months, and she was uh, quite symptomatic. Uh, really not able to do much around her house, and she was also quite frail. She really did not want to have uh, another surgery. And uh, this is her echocardiogram. You can see here uh, that uh, despite uh, an early good uh, surgical result in terms of MR relief, at about eight years later, uh, she's got a lot of uh, mitral regurgitation. You can see that uh, here. Uh, you can also see that uh, what was done was a partial aneuplasty. And essentially what's happened is uh, the aneuplasty has moved away from the trigones of the mitral valve. And as a result, you have this uh, MR. Now the challenge here is that she asked me if we would do mitral clip. And with mitral clip, as we all know, you need both good anterior and posterior leaflets. But at the time of surgery, uh, the surgeon had uh, resected the mitral valve uh, in the P2 area. And you can see here, there's hardly any tissue uh, that's present there. And that's right where uh, the MR is. Uh, you've got loss of coaptation in this area because the heart's enlarged. This is our uh, mitral gradient, which was two. So uh, we had a long discussion about what the options were. And I told her we could try mitral clip, but I wasn't sure it was gonna work because uh, there wasn't a lot of posterior leaflet tissue to anchor. But uh, we were able to do it, and this is how it was done. Uh, we got a height of 4.3, and this is with the old system. So remember that uh, with the old mitral clip system, you want a height of three and a half to four. Uh, but the reason why we took so much height is because uh, that posterior pathology uh, is, it needs to be addressed. Uh, you know, there isn't a lot of tissue there, and so we need to drag things posterior in order to make this procedure work. And so this is how it's done. You can see the mitral clip, which has been aligned over the um, uh, central area of MR. Uh, I then uh, push the mitral clip over and grab uh, as much of the posterior annuloplasty, uh, sorry, the, uh, as much of the posterior annulus or, and the surgical annuloplasty uh, as you can see here. And essentially what I'm trying to go for is grab any tissue in that posterior area and, and affix the anterior leaflet to the annuloplasty ring. And so here, uh, this is the clip which has been passed over into the LB. We then uh, pull up against that aneuplasty ring, as you can see here, and we're securing the anterior leaflet 
uh, to the annuloplasty wing, as you can see here in the lower right-hand side. This is what it looks like with the grasp. So here's the anterior leaflet, and you can see a small amount of tissue there uh, in the uh, uh, posterior annulus. We then secure it, uh, as you can see here, uh, and then uh, this is a biocommissural view, and then with, uh, with that, uh, there's no uh, residual MR. So this is what it looks like. You can see uh, that anterior leaflet is essentially stapled uh, to the annuloplasty ring. The gradient uh, remains uh, insignificant. It was only four here. And here's a nice uh, fluoroscopic view uh, showing the clip uh, that uh, is essentially, uh, again, stapled to whatever tissue there is in the posterior annulus, as well as that annuloplasty uh, area. And here's uh, the final review, uh, view uh, with the clip released. And you can see it's actually quite satisfying. Uh, the clip is nice and stable here. There's no residual MR. And you can see, uh, and this is a 3D view here of a, a different kind of tissue bridge where the anterior leaflet is uh, connected here uh, down below. And uh, she's done quite well. Uh, uh, she's, it's been now almost uh, three years uh, since you treated her. And she's actually gotten her tricuspid valve treated now as part of the Triluminate study. Uh, but the key points in this study are that uh, uh, post-surgical mitral clip is feasible. Even when there's a small amount of tissue, uh, you just need to go very posterior as possible uh, with your transeptal uh, so that you can get your clip aligned as posterior as possible. Now, in retrospect, I might have considered more than one clip just to make sure it was stable. Uh, but, uh, but she actually did well with just one clip uh, despite that. You know, in these days, I think it behooves us that uh, if there's concern about how much stability there is, you want to put more than one clip uh, so that things can be held. So I'm just going to look here and see if there are any uh, questions for, uh, for this. No? Good. All righty. Okay, and then our, our uh, fourth case uh, for tonight is this 80-year-old uh, man. So this is uh, an 80-year-old man, and he had had a uh, mitral clip uh, about six months ago uh, done elsewhere. And uh, despite the mitral clip, he was still really symptomatic, just essentially class three. Uh, managed to avoid the hospital, but uh, still really symptomatic and quite unsatisfied with this, uh, with this procedure. So here are his views. You can see here, uh, he has uh, some element of degenerative MR. Uh, but what, you, uh, what I want you to focus on is that he had a clip placed here on the medial side, and he's actually got a, a, a perforation here in the anterior leaflet. And uh, with that, uh, with color, you can see uh, there's a lot of MR going right through that perforation, as you can see here in this uh, LVOT view, as well as this uh, commissural or slightly off commissural view uh, showing you quite a bit uh, of MR. So um, the way we dis, uh, treated this patient was uh, I knew or I thought uh, it would be best to, uh, to put a plug in the, inside that anterior leaflet perforation. Now the, the challenge with that is that uh, that anterior leaflet is not going to be very strong by itself uh, to hold a plug. Uh, in other words, uh, if we were to place just a plug in there, the leaflet could swing, uh, and uh, that swinging uh, could cause a, a tear. So the way we treated this was we went in and placed a second mitral clip. And the second mitral clip was placed here. Uh, you can see here uh, with this placement, uh, we've actually created a nice landing zone. So here's a second clip. It's kind of going from 11 uh, to 5 o'clock. Uh, this is the uh, trajectory that we used to place it, as you can see here. And not surprisingly, because he still had that perforation, you can see that the, um, there's still a lot of MR, and that's not surprising. Uh, but what we've done is we've created a landing zone, uh, as you can see here. Now, with that landing zone, uh, we then can go in and place a plug. So here, uh, right down the middle, uh, in that uh, leaflet uh, uh, perforation, 
We then take a multipurpose catheter uh, uh, that's been passed through an agilis. And you can see here, here's the agilis catheter. Uh, the multipurpose catheter is uh, advanced uh, through the perforation over a wire. Uh, this is simply just a glide wire uh, that went through. And you can see that uh, here uh, that uh, the, the catheter is across that area of perforation here. And once we do that, we then put an AVP2 plug. Uh, and I think it's hard to see here, but the distal disc here is in the LV through the multipurpose catheter, as you can see here. We then pull the plug back. Uh, and this is the plug, uh, which is essentially pulled against uh, the area of the leaflet perforation on the LV side. This is in between uh, those two clips. And this is a nice view of it. So here's, uh, um, this is the first clip that was placed elsewhere. This is our new clip, which is placed here. This created this nice landing zone. And then between those two clips, here's a nice 12 millimeter AVP2 device, uh, which is right in the area of the perforation. Uh, and here's a nice uh, 3D view uh, showing uh, the, uh, the plug in place. And here you can see it. Uh, the, there's, uh, most of the plug is on the LV side and that's completely okay. Uh, there was no LVT uh, gradient. And you can see here with this plug in position, there's also no more uh, uh, MR, uh, very, very mild MR left behind here. The plug has essentially sealed uh, that perforation. So he's done well uh, in, in follow-up and uh, it's been now almost two and a half years. So um, those are the cases that I have for you tonight. And so uh, I'm just gonna go through the questions here uh, 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 that have come up. So anticoagulation regimen. So uh, I presume this is about uh, the plug and this is just DAPT. And usually we just recommend uh, dual interplay therapy for a month. Uh, what size AVP2 device? This is a 12 millimeter uh, device. Uh, and this is just based on um, uh, uh, the size as measured on uh, the transesophageal echo. Uh, I will tell you that uh, when you're doing uh, these plugs, uh, do not size it um, uh, according to the waist. Uh, what you really want to do is you want to have um, uh, the, not just the retention disc, but you want to have um, uh, the minimal uh, portion or the connecting portion uh, of the AVP2 spanning the perforation. Uh, what I've learned in doing these uh, with these plugs is that the, the waste of the plug can actually make the perforation worse. And so it's best just to put just the connector um, uh, in, the, in the area of the plug. And I, I see um, uh, Gautam has a question about here about um, uh, risk of erosion. Uh, so uh, I, I do think that there's that possibility. And, uh, and that's why uh, we put the second uh, clip in uh, to help minimize the amount of motion. Uh, I think without uh, a nice landing zone to keep things relatively mobile, there will be a lot of mobility uh, in that plug. Uh, so for that reason, uh, the plugs work really well in the commissures uh, where there's uh, less relative motion or if you've created a landing zone uh, like I've done here. Uh, we um, have now followed this patient for over three years, and, and uh, there's been no uh, evidence of any erosion. Uh, these devices uh, are MRI compatible, and uh, and then have I seen any hemolysis? I have not, um, and I and I think that with the ABP twos, uh, the risk of hemolysis is extremely low, if non-existent. Uh, the VSD devices are are, are completely different. Uh, VSD occluders are known uh, to be hemolytic. And so, uh, so uh, I just be very careful about using them, uh, if at all. Uh, so there was a concern about mitosinosis, but uh, he didn't have a gradient, and uh, he did well. He did really well. So, thank you. All righty. Well, um, that's all I have for you tonight. I hope you enjoyed those uh, cases. Uh, we kind of whipped through uh, 14 cases uh, relatively quick here. And, uh, um, um, but I hope you enjoyed those four cases and I hope you all really consider coming out to uh, CVI this year. It, it is gonna prove to be another uh, great conference. Um, July 18th to the 20th at the Hyatt Regency. 
uh, please remember that we all uh, also have um, uh, travel grants uh, and case competitions can that can help support uh, many, if not all of you, uh, to come uh, and, and attend the conference. So uh, with that, uh, on behalf of uh, Subhash, Mehdi, and Manos, and me, uh, thank you very much for attending our webinar. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.